Good. Hi. Good morning. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> well, we've been hearing um, a lot uh, in the course of our session uh, about engaging with stakeholders. Uh, we've also been hearing a lot about engaging social media. Um, and we tend to think of those two recommendations in particular um, as separate recommendations. Uh, recommendation number one, engage more in social media across, uh, across multiple platforms to catalyze climate communications and on a separate agenda begin to engage uh, stakeholders. But in fact, uh, from my point of view and the wor work that I do, uh, those are really one and the same thing. Um, to the degree that social media is driven by values and to the degree that communities essentially cohere around values, they cohere around stakeholders. So to the degree that we begin to engage stakeholders um, as partners um, in climate communication, we are perforce also engaging in whole new ways social media. We tend to think, uh, up to this point, we, when we think about organizing, uh, uh, catalyzing uh, social media, we think about what I call mini-me versions of videos you know, and graphs. Uh, more colorful, more exciting, you know, more, uh, more engaging. And in fact, obviously, there's you know, a place for that. But at the end of the day, what gets passed around and research supports this again and again and the content around which community forms is very rarely about something. It's always about someone. Um, and at the end of the day, all the animations in the world can't really uh, hold a candle to the articulations of content as it, might re as it might relate to what concerns me, what moves me, what I'm excited about, what I'm distressed about, what I'm angry, uh, or what I'm joyful um, about. So the, essentially what we're doing when, we're when we talk about engaging in social media is we aren't actually engaging a new communications model which social media suggests and which I will suggest in the course of this talk in, uh, in embracing new communications uh, models that catalyze social media, we are essentially, uh, br we are bringing forth new opportunities in science communications that we have yet to leverage you know, in our work. This, here, this slide here is simply a really crude summary of essentially the state of communications to date, of really all communications, but with particular application to science. The information, Surfeit model, I'll start with. My background uh, was in, in, in media before I moved into climate strategy, communication strategy and research over the past decade. But <clears throat> up until then, um, I was essentially involved deeply in programming, Discovery Channel, CNN, et cetera. And I came up with a, I came up against what we're really all coming up against, which is the end of the day, in order to engage and invest in programming that people will actually watch, our metric of success in media, obviously, is advertiser revenues or sub sub subscriber revenues. In order to engage in media and produce media, create media that people were going to uh, watch, we had, we had to figure out a way to make it exciting. But we were in a very, very small silo of what was regarded as correct environmental content, which is to say it had to, do about, it had to be about the planet. It could not also be about people. Right? The environmental programming, and still to this day, environmental news is shrinking because there's still the perception that environment equals the planet. And all the rhetorical and semantic tricks I tried in the world, calling it environment with an I, etc., ultimately uh, I, uh, uh, resulted in um, defeat. If we wanted to ultimately to produce programming or generate messages that, w that, ult that, that spoke to the business integration with the environment, social justice and the environment. Okay, well that's the business channel. Okay, well that's the advocacy, uh, 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 that's the advocacy channel and etc. So we found ourselves extraordinarily siloed in, uh, in, uh, in our ability and our capacity uh, to uh, leverage environmental messaging. As a result of that, 
The information, the, and the information surfeit model, excuse me, the information surfeit model is basically very simply just what it sounds like. It's essentially don't focus on the facts. People have more than enough information. They're overwhelmed with facts. Make it dramatic. If you have to kind of play around and cheat with the facts, then do what you got to do to essentially engage your audience and engage um, and, and generate the revenues and the subscriber base that your programming warrants in order to stay on the air and stay in circulation. The opposite model, <clears throat> this, by the way, oh, yeah, yeah. That's the information surfeit model, <laughs> okay? And that's the information deficit model. The information deficit model is essentially what we practice here, which is based on give people enough information, give them the facts, yes, yes, make it digestible, make it funny, animate it, make it exciting, do what you have to do, uh, uh, do what you have to do uh, to make it as clear as possible, but at the end of the day, it's a facts-driven approach. The problem is, Neither of these approaches work. Neither of these approaches have what we call in the communications, I've got a problem here, yeah. Communications problem, I have, why is this not happening? What, what is happening here? <laughs> Neither of these have what's called the long tail. The information deficit model, there we go, can you hear me? Yeah, better. The information deficit uh, model, leaves you feeling weary and challenged, and the information surfeit model leaves you leaving bleary and cathartic, and ultimately it doesn't last. You walk out of the movie theater, you walk out of the experience, and you say, I'm really jazzed, I really want to be like Leo DiCaprio, now what do I do? All right? So essentially, what I, what I began working on about a, a decade ago, more details of the case studies uh, in a moment, is developing a, developing a model by which we focus less on downstream, what we call downstream communications, less on how we message the science. Communications has always been, and Susan addressed this you know, in her talk yesterday, communications has always been regarded as essentially an after-the-fact application. Create the science and then rely on others to figure out a way to make it as attractive as possible. In the United States, we call that putting lipstick on a pig. Right? Um, and what we began to realize is that rather than focusing on how we message science, beginning to focus on what we message. And rather than, and, and, and to begin to ask ourselves not what we can do for climate change, but what addressing climate change can do for us. So that our messaging ultimately begins not only to reflect what we are asking of people to accept or be persuaded by the science, but what the science is asking of us. And the upstream communications architecture essentially focuses here on formation, ultimately, ultimately then affecting projection, what you say, and the reception, how the communication is received. And what I'm gonna focus on in the course of this talk is formation. So this is a, this is a, a slide uh, that Dan Kahan does from the Cultural Cognition Project at Yale Law School, who I work uh, closely with. And this is just basically a very rough schema um, which represents the basis of the communication applications that we practice and develop in our program. And by the way, what our program es essentially does is in fact engage with stakeholders to practice, build, open, develop, and deploy communication pathways by which science-oriented targets can be incorporated into stakeholder siloed concerns. And essentially, it is, the slide is um, as it suggests. You are marrying essentially knowledge, you know, and connect, you're marrying knowledge and meaning, as Jesse said yesterday. You're connecting sort of evidence with evolving cultural worldviews in a ways that allows for the facilitation, not the advocacy of, but the facilitation of the revision of one's factual belief. Facts and belief there are, are used uh, uh, together, juxtaposed intentionally. The approach in general, and we've heard a lot about this here, is essentially, again, 
at the end of the day, if we really want to, if we really want to encourage, facilitate, catalyze science uptake, we need to find a way to, to transpose the science, you know, into, into messaging which is less about something and more about someone, right? And certainly these approaches are not mutually, uh, you know, uh, exclusive either. What we want to do is generate this kind of a reaction <laughs> with an IPCC text, which is, I'm excited because, oh my goodness, I, I am reflected in this and my concerns are reflected um, in this document. What we want to do is begin to move from questions as why is carbon dioxide increasing so much to how does increasing carbon dioxide impact the choices a consumer makes. How does increasing carbon dioxide impact the choices a supplier makes? Where will we run? What will we grow? Will we still get along? Will I be free? Will I be safe? Will my home still even be here? Will my wine taste the same? What will this new world look like? How much worse will the shoveling get? And what we suggest and what we practice is ways in which each of these data modules we essentially see as narrative rubrics. Each of these <clears throat> selections of data offer us opportunities to develop narratives that connect that data to individual sector concerns, biases, ambitions, goals, and outcomes. So over the past <coughs> seven, <coughs> ten years, we've held a series of workshops around the world in the developed and developing worlds in which we brought together this sort of suite and stakeholders uh, and others. We're also now doing the same uh, with students in a university network now in a, uh, around 65 universities around the world. But what we found <clears throat> and what we continue to find is that what we're really dealing with in bringing it's, it, what we're really dealing with in bringing stakeholders together is essentially a question of coming to terms with different languages. Right? We all speak different languages. It's one thing ultimately to say, well, let's basically engage with stakeholders, and it's quite another to come to the terms with the, come to terms with the fact that stakeholders all speak different languages. At the top of each vertical axis in each of these sector silos, you'll see a representation of what is essentially been determined as the primary value when we ask a thousand respondents around the world. <clears throat> and we basically did ask them, it wasn't more scientific than that, is what is sort of the top priority value that defines the language that you speak? As you see, the top value in science is accuracy, in media it's drama, policy realism, business actionability, and belief archetypal. It needs to speak to our symbols, it needs to speak to our collective iconographic um, understanding. And so what you see here is that when you, for example, want science, when a, when a scientist and media are together in a room, you have essentially what looks like entirely opposite sets of values that come up against each other. We like to blame the naysayers, and we like to blame the consolidation of media, particularly in the United States, as the reason for the, what we call in media the climate what? factor in, the, in terms of the, the, the little coverage um, that we get. But in fact, there's more to it than that. There really is, and Susan addressed this, I think, very well in her presentation yesterday as well. There really is a necessity here to build bridges between the two. And, in, and the, one of the ways we find to build bridges between the two um, is, in fact, to, uh, to, to generate stories based on the combined understanding. This doesn't have to be either or. There are, there are ample oppor opportunities, for example, to marry in media my need to highlight uncertainty with your need for accuracy. And I'll give you examples of, of stories about the stories toward that end in a moment. Likewise, there are ways essentially to equate the media's need to highlight certainty with the religious need for emphatic programming to build a following. Likewise, there are ways to build connections between policy speaking to need and highlighting uncertainty. Highlighting caution 
with careful. How careful do I need to be in order to institute or advocate for an effective policy can also mean how careful do I need to be with a constituency who is really important to my base and really matters to my political future. Another technique we use, and this is based on Maslow's humanistic uh, uh, triangle, of which I'm sure many of you are familiar, <coughs> is we're in the process still um, of, 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 a, of a series of uh, workshops around the world where people self-identify in categories. What's most important to you? Basic survival, my safety, my place in sort of the, on the, in the uh, uh, a, a social ladder, my sense of self-esteem or my sense of self-fulfillment. And, and when we put clips in front of them, and these are video clips, in front of this suite of group, what we find is that there is a, there, the, 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 there's a and, and it was on a scale of one to 10, how much do these stories ultimately move you to essentially do something about climate change, act on climate change. And what we find, of course, as you can see here, is that the science and anti-science stories, which is most of what constitutes what we call environmental programming, only essentially fully, only, only fully um, uh, uh, integrates uh, with the consciousness of people who are at the very, very top of the ladder. Those who basically um, are already self-fulfilled, have a sense of themselves, and really can more or less, and I don't mean this cynically, afford a global view. Whereas people who are concerned about basic survival are concerned mostly with, with narratives of global health and narratives of food and water. Within each of those silos, there's also opportunities to speak to different aspects of each of our beings, right? There is in the top here, interior, personal awareness. What matters to me spiritually? What matters to me What's important to me? Where do I want to go? What does love mean to me? <clears throat> Individual activity is, how do I want to be known and recognized by my friends? If I really care about food waste, for example, I, is it also true that I want to be known as someone who cares about food waste? Moreover, I'm interested in a shared experience. I want to my interest in food waste, my compassion, my, action, my desire to take action. And I want to join up with others based on the, what we call the I, it, we, its quadrants. Example of what I was uh, alluding to earlier, this is an example of essentially moving from the data to the narratives. An example of that process really apply the various processes that I referred to in the previous slides, essentially amount to, uh, 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 resulting in these kinds of narratives. And these kinds of narratives then become the basis of social networks and communities. So you have an opportunity for climate change to, to, and to focus on climate change communication as more than persuading people in more attractive, more sexy, more exciting, more animated, more colorful, more simple, more accessible ways and begin to leverage climate science and, and, and help facilitate essentially network buildings, network building around a process by which we essentially facilitate narratives. And narratives are what ultimately form the core <clears throat> of these social networks. Further, not, not for this room, not, not for today, but here's an example of three basic social network structures. The bucket brigade structure, which is exactly what it sounds like. You're putting out a fire and you're passing the bucket. The telephone, the, well, I can't see my own writing here. The, the, mili the military squad, which is we all act together, let's take action, the moveon.org uh, uh, example. Um, and then the telephone tree, wherever the, the telephone tree, which is essentially exactly what it sounds like, is I call three people, three people call six people, six people call nine people. And each of the narratives that I presented in the earlier slide on the Maslow Triangle also correspond to different social networks. Excuse me. 
This is essentially a summary of the process and the methodology by which we, this is a particular example on which we are basically focusing on developing policy engagement around direct air capture as a technology. And essentially what we're moving here is from research to action, essentially trying to encourage policymakers in the Department of Energy to consider direct air capture as one of the modalities that they begin to invest in, research, res, invest resources and research in. Research in. And what we do is, in order to go from research to action, we essentially process the information through a value-driven communication in which each of the stakeholders who have a stake in action in this respect um, are become a part of the upstream conversation. <clears throat> this is a, an example <clears throat> Uh, in a fo focus group, this is a, we have, uh, I run focus, focus groups also in the private sector. This is really for an advertising uh, marketing concern in which we tested each of these two image, images uh, and, 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 and asking essentially those sitting in the audience different demographics. Firstly, which impacts you more? And secondly, which essentially would inspire you to take action on behalf of the planet? This model here, the Earthrise image, is essentially a summation <clears throat> of what all of our communications have been based on, essentially trying to inspire awe, respect for the planet. The planet is, the planet is fragile. It is, what is it? Spaceship, <clears throat> spaceship Earth. We, are, we, we, we have only one planet, etc. But in fact, and this image in the 70s and 80s actually tested really well, all right? But here we are in 2015, and this image does not test well. By an 80 to 20, this is the image that, that, spe this is the image that speaks to the, uh, the, uh, the respondents. And it doesn't speak in the way that we anticipated. We expected, well, it's a personal story. There's a person in it, right? That's not what they say. What they say is that they see themselves in this story. It's not simply that there's a person. We all like to say, well, put people in it. If you put people in it, then people can relate to people. People don't relate to people. People don't really care about other people, right? And they mostly care about people that ultimately reflect them. And what they do here is this story enables them, gives them an opportunity to imagine a narrative. What would I do in this story? What ultimately is he running from? Does the dog know he's being saved? Where is his mother? Where's my mother? Would I do the same? And by the way, what's going on in this picture? He's running, am I over time? Okay, okay, so, right. Well, anyway, he's running from a typhoon, right? And the connection between this story and the increasing frequency and intensity um, of typhoons brings us back directly to conversations and dialogues with climate science enable, uh, create a context, you know, for this story. Two, two more minutes, one more minute. All right, let me see here. I was told I, I see here, all right. All right, I'll leave you with one example. Sorry about that. <clears throat> okay, one example. All right, so the, actually, an easier, shorter example. Okay, wine industry. We're in the process right now of essentially setting up workshops between climate scientists and wine growers in Northern California. And the idea there is essentially to engage wine industry with climate science to figure out essentially what, is the, what will be the state of their in 2010, 2020, 2050, etc. And what you find is when you engage in this dialogue, the lack of certainty, the, the, the insufficiency of high resolution models to answer these questions are completely, entirely irrelevant to the dialogue. The wine growers want to know where will we be in 10 and where will we be in 2020, which grape, Chardonnay or Sauvignon, will be most favored um, by the climatic conditions. No matter how certain you are, this is ultimately what we want to know. And by the way, what will the nights be like? I'm not really into this for the money. I'm into this for my soul. One vintner says, I just want to know what my nights are going to feel like. 
Another says, I want to know what kind of grape to invest in. Another vintner says, well, I don't like this really at all. And now I'm really seeing the impact that this will have on my industry. I'm not prepared. There's too much inertia in my industry. I am not prepared to change. What can I do to help get on the bandwagon of mitigation to, con to make my... To, to make contribution. What that all adds up to is an opportunity to approach a, a policymaker in California with data that the wine industry, the $13 billion wine industry, is now engaging seriously in climate change. And this is an example of a, of a social network that is formed around that workshop. The academic wino the effects of climate change to the global wine industry, a meta-analysis for SOM journal, and that's entirely due to a dialogue that was facilitated between climate scientists and the wine industry, and this drives itself. The IPCC or climate scientists would not be driving this, this drives itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'd like to introduce Beth Holland. Uh, on stage to give um, <laughs> a few uh, comments. Um, Beth, you're a professor of climate change um, in the University of South Pacific in Fiji. Yes, Welcome. I am. Thank you Welcome. so much. And I just want to give you a little bit of perspective on what our unique case is in the Pacific. Because I work at a University and at the Center for the Pacific Center for the Environment and Sustainable Development. There are two regional universities in the world, both serve AOSIS, the Alliance of Small Island States. One is the University of the West Indies and one is the University of the South Pacific. So I work for 15 countries going from East Timor, north of Papua New Guinea all the way over to the Cook Islands. So it's a, in that, those 15 countries, we have Tuvalu, we have the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and Kiribati, the three most threatened countries by sea level rise. So when I came to the Pacific four years ago, I came as a research scientist. I had 21 years of experience working at the National Center for Atmospheric Research and the Max Planck Institute for Biochemistry. I had media training, I had leadership training, and I had two stints with the IPCC as lead author. And, one st and I also served for Working Group One, and I served as contributing author for Working Group Two. I thought, I've got the science facts. I can come in as a science wonder woman, and I can build bridges, and we can make this happen. I failed miserably. I really did, because I thought that we could really combine forces with the vulnerability of the Pacific Islands and the science facts and make a difference. Why did I fail? Well, there were a number of contributing factors. I had no Pacific experience. I didn't know my audience. And I came in on the heels of the legacy of IPCC in the clothing of Marari Law, who was um, our disappointment in the AR4 with Himalayan glaciers. So that meant that science really didn't have a lot of credibility at that point in the, in the most vulnerable countries of the world. So what we did is exactly what was described by Paul, which is focus on stakeholder engagement. Focus on the audience that we were serving. So I spent a lot of time listening, and I spent a lot of time listening to my students who were postgraduate students in climate change. I spent a lot of time listening to the governments that I serve, what they felt like they needed. And I spent a lot of time in villages because this was a grassroots effort. We were funded at that time by the EU to focus on climate change adaptation at the village level. So we had to learn a lot about the human experience and that was part of our audience. So what did we accomplish since, that, since my failures? What we have now is a robust training program for climate scientists 
We have a postgraduate program that's now populated by more than 150 students going from postgraduate diplomas to master's degrees to PhDs. We have 123 students have graduated with postgraduate diplomas in climate change, 25 master's degrees in climate change. And this year will be our first PhDs in climate change. We began working with the governments through the crop process, I mean, through the COP process, attending the UNFCCC's and writing science briefs. So at the Paris Agreement for the 15 countries that we work in, we had 20 negotiators who had graduated from our program or who were alumni from our program. Those 20 negotiators served eight different countries and served on the delegations of eight different countries. My gaining of credibility came from my students because I didn't look like the people that I served. I was only credible because my students said, she's worth listening to. And so I had to focus on that stakeholder engagement and build up relationships part of supporting the science. And so we wrote briefs, and we wrote briefs, and we showed up at COP after COP. For the Paris Agreement, there were eight pronouncements, eight, um, I'm for missing the word, eight declarations from the Pacific leaders. The Pacific leaders turned to us and to the IPCC through us for support on their negotiations. So for the Paris Agreement, we had science, a coordinated strategy, we had done the outreach, and we were able to stand strong for the first time as 15 Pacific countries. And standing strong as 15 Pacific countries also supported the alliance of small island states. And that was, I think, the indication of success because I could go from the scientific community to the leaders and say, here's the science that we need. At the same time, we're also now working in over 100 villages throughout the Pacific in those 15 countries. I didn't learn how to do the science education from the media training as much as I learned from listening in the villages. And we use that village-based approach of connecting person to person to translate the science to the leaders in a way that the leaders can take action at the level of the Paris Agreement and at the level of having climate change policies in most of the 15 countries, either already approved by cabinet or under consideration for approval by cabinet. And in Fiji, we also have a policy that will guide relocation efforts because unlike the surrounding Pacific countries, including our most recent colonial powers, there is no way, there is no mechanism in place for accepting those who will be displaced by climate change, except in Fiji. So. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. We will take some comments and questions. If, if Paul would like to come back on stage, I have Adam, I have uh, Lindsay, and Claudia, thank you. And Neil. Hello, thanks, Paul. Thanks, thanks Beth. Um, lots, lots of ideas in, in your talk, Paul, that, that resonate um, very strongly with the work that, that we do at Climate Outreach in the UK, the importance of values and thinking about the language that different social groups use and developing narratives and stories that start with those values and people's interests. I think that really gets mm -hmm. to the heart of public engagement. Exactly. Um, obviously, there's a major question as to how, how and uh, in what way could that, that be married and mapped over to the, to the work that the IPCC does, which is obviously quite different. Um, it feels to me, and it would be great to hear both of your perspectives and other people's on this as well, that the, the, the place that these two things can come together is in the derivative products that are associated with IPCC reports where you can you can start with a particular audience you can ask them what they care about the things they're interested in how do they engage with other issues who do they trust on other issues and you can work through those channels as a platform for for, for talking about climate change science and and possible solutions um, it, so it feels to me like the derivatives um, is, is the place to to, to bring these kinds of 
is together. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Lindsay? I wanted to thank you all, particularly for talking about the personal. This is a big challenge to us. How, what does it mean to me? A um, few points. In, in the AR5, there's a statement which says, um, on business as usual, this could make it difficult to work outdoors. It's one of those statements in the, in the report which kind of hits you. Like, don't you want to elaborate on what that means? How do we make that out of the sterile into the personal? Um, what we find, and I think what you're saying, is that most people, and when we talk about stakeholders, I talk about people, we're all in there. Um, they want to know what's happening, they want to know how urgent it is, and they want to know what they can do about it. How do we empower them? Which is exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. The only thing I wanted to add was, we often ask what's beneath the skepticism, what's beneath the pushback. What are we afraid of? What are people afraid of? Not just financial interests, which we know affect but what's the fear and how can we address that? And then the one thing I wanted to add for Paul, when you had a list of questions, the question that was missing to me, the really basic <coughs> one, is how can I be part of the solution? Because that's what we need to reach out. And I think that's in the report for the R6, if there is a section, helping people to see what makes a difference. Thank you. Uh, Claudia? Yes, uh, just a question for Paul. Uh, uh, Paul, how do you think you can reconcile uh, uh, upstream communications with the, the stance of IPCC on neutrality? Uh, it, it seems to me from your talk that you have to assume that uh, you're not just stating the facts when you're doing this kind of values-based communication. How, how do you get the two together? Okay, do you want to respond to those three and then we have two more? Yes, certainly. Yes. Well, first of all, I'll take them in reverse order, perhaps, because that's the most... Um, um, first of all, I want to be very clear. We are not actually... And uh, there's a slide at the very, very end. Just the one you can just read it while I talk. See, that can... <clears throat> uh, it's very clear that we're not actually inviting scientists to engage in values based and in, in values recommendations or prescriptions. What we are doing is essentially inviting scientists to partner with values based mm -hmm. stakeholders to give their values and a scientific basis, right? The winemakers and the climate scientists, uh, I mean, I'm sure a lot of climate scientists love wine <laughs> at the end of the day, but essentially what, what this conversation was really about is. <clears throat> Here are my concerns. How can your science address these concerns? In some cases, science can you know, and cannot. One of the things that has come out of this already is the wine industry, for example, funding uh, higher resolution modeling for specific regions in Northern mm -hmm. California in order to give them more information about the kind of growing patterns, ultimately, that they can, uh, that they can expect. And in, in a pilot you know, in Mozambique, where essentially what we, were, uh, what we thought we were going to do is encourage sort of climate change education and awareness. We didn't end up doing that at <coughs> all. To your example, what we ended up doing is essentially engaging with weathermen and meteorologists you know, on the aspect of typhoons that affected Mozambique and, the, uh, and, and how the, frequent, the likely frequency, greater frequency and intensity of typhoons, even with degrees of uncertainty, it allowed the meteorologist to say these typhoons are likely not anomalous. They will ultimately continue. Furthermore, we partner scientists with urban engineers to develop road signage for evacuation um, routes. We, we partnered with indigenous tribal leaders to develop actually mm -hmm. a treehouse network where people could flee to a, you know, a tree of, uh, people could flee um, in the case, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the advance another typhoon. This resulted in many lost, uh, many saved lives and also increased funding because at the end of the day what you're doing then in engaging all the stakeholders is you're engaging media because media ultimately wants to be involved you know in prod tree what news station isn't going to want us to be involved in a tree in a in cover projects. So at the end of the day you then you have more media engagement and there's a very famous story that came out of this you know, pilot that you're probably all familiar with, which was a baby was born in one of those trees in the midst of a, an, an evacuation. This became the climate change baby. That climate change baby has now grown in, up into a young man who runs one of the most successful 
Mexico's um, in, um, and Mozambique and is focused on mangrove forestation. So not the same, and I think it's really important that there's a big difference between essentially engaging with stakeholders to give the, their values a scientific basis so they can be more effective mm -hmm. than essentially advancing their cause. <clears throat> okay. Um, Long answer. I, the, maybe I, I covered. Uh, the, yes. Beth, would you like to quickly respond, and then we have three I, more I questions. I agree completely and with what you said because knowing what their values are, and listening so that we understand where they're coming from, is the single most critical thing for getting the shared power of combining what is really the wonder of science and the wonder of science discovery with the perils and triumphs of being human. Okay, uh, I have uh, Laura and uh, Jessica. Could you give me tw 10 seconds to give it one answer about the, how can I be part of the solution? 10 seconds, please. I think my answer to that, obviously it's a really good question, like beyond recycling and bicycling, what do we do You know, at the end of the day? And the answer there, in my view, and in my research and work, again, there is to aggregate to aggregate. Ultimately, what can I do in the wine industry as a wine, as a vintner, you know, to ultimately be a part of the solution through the lens that I live and I care about? And so essentially what we're doing is aggregating up solutions that combine to a meta solution. Okay. Thank and you. what can I do in a village, the villager, Correct. that will aggregate up? And right. that's why the grassroots has to combine with the global decisions. Right. Okay. Um, I'd encourage you to be to make short comments or statements or questions yeah. now because the we're really running over time. Yeah. I have uh, I, I have um, Laura, Jessica, Leo, and Chris, and that's it. <laughs> okay. Um, are we all that selfish, like you suggested? It, it's a bit uh, contradictory to what uh, Elizabeth experiences. It, because there I see more of the gregarious or the gregarian uh, characteristics of human beings. We talk to each other, we look for comfort. It's not only that we care because we see uh, ourselves projected into that, but because we have some sort of empathy, most of us, I guess. You, you, you push the, the point of being selfish and, and, and that we care because we care about ourselves. Jessica, um, can we do yeah. the comments and then we'll wrap right, up at okay. the end. Um, I just uh, want to, to ask Paul a, a question. I, I appreciate you showing the impact chain, but there's one slide that you wanted to show. Um, I was wondering why, because in, in our country we saw a, a lot of drama in terms of the images. We saw the end, we see the end product of, of climate change. It moves us, but where are we where we really need, uh, what we really need is to know what to do about it. And AR5, for example, and you know, the assessment reports say that we need to address our vulnerabilities. So in terms of the methodology, uh, I was wondering your last slide, whether that was an influence diagram, that which tells us what's the in between the hazard and the impact, uh, and the impact so that we can ask what's in between. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, Leo? And then Chris. One word of caution. Yes, it's important for IPCC authors to liaise with the values of the, of the uh, stakeholder groups. But the only way to serve them is there would be peer-reviewed literature because IPCC's task is, mm -hmm. should be, and should remain assessment of existing high-quality scientific literature. So what could be said to this group, we take your concerns of the wine industry seriously, but please see to it that there is peer-reviewed literature available before a certain deadline, otherwise we cannot take your concerns into account. Thank you. Chris? You know, if there's a single theme that really resonates across all of the communication presentations, it's you shouldn't view your audience as a homogeneous, um, Addressing many of the specific recommendations we see in, in Paul's presentation and best experiences and 
John already talked about, and, and I think in terms of uh, lessening the magnitude of the step that's required to get from where we are to where we want to be, we ought to recognize that there are lots of high quality components that are already in the IPCC communications environment. Thank you. Uh, would you like to ask Paul and then we'll hear from okay. Beth at the end? Okay. Uh, uh, what's the 45 second uh, aggregated response? Okay, first of all, um, when, every time you get on a plane, they say, take, put your own mask first. And it always shocks you. You say, wait a minute, there's a little baby next to me. You mean I put my own mask on first and then I turn to the baby? Essential, that's, is that selfish? You know? Or th that's practical, okay? So at the, end, at the end of the day, what we're really talking about here, we have to start somewhere, okay? And placing a value judgment on people, on, on essentially developing strategies around what people care about and what moves them is not necessarily synonymous with being selfish. Some people, in, some people and many people in the Western world, it's usually people who are only at the top of the self-fulfillment triangle. But in the developing world, that's not the case. People can be entirely motivated by a narrative which is based on compassion, care, and generosity. To rely on that narrative to move the Western world is exactly where we are right now, you know, which is essentially almost nowhere, you know. We had an example where uh, a, a group did a food waste study, which is essentially all about trying to motivate people around the connection between food waste and, and essentially uh, 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 managing food waste better in the connection to you know, climate change. The campaign got absolutely nowhere, right? But then what we did is essentially, okay, forget about the meta-messaging. Why don't we develop one pilot with a series of public schools around food waste, where they themselves get to be, see the experience of managing food waste and how it benefits them. That experience was ultimately, they partnered with scientists and engineers to put that pilot on its feet. That pilot then created news, that then created social media, and the food waste ecosystem in the United States is now one of the more effective communication modalities connecting people to climate change that exists. Because scientists weren't driving it, but scientists were facilitating it. And by the way, they were facilitating it with only peer-reviewed literature. Thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, Beth? And I think that it's the balance between the collective and the individual. And in the Pacific, the priority is not the individual as it is in the U.S. or elsewhere. It is the collective. And that's a really important piece. And making decisions for the collective are also selfish decisions because I'm better off if my collective is better off. And peer-reviewed literature is critical, and how that gets translated is important because the failure to use peer-reviewed literature was why I had such trouble coming in taking over from Marari. But when we get to the village level, in our case, what we're doing is we're using poster-sized pictures that depict warming or depict rainfall projections or depict sea level rise projections. And remember, one of the things I found difficult going to the Pacific was I couldn't find very many measuring sticks. It was hard to find a meter stick. And so finally what I figured out is that the length of a Pacific canoe paddle is about a meter long, just a little more than a meter long. So now when I talk about a meter of sea level rise by the end of this century, I use a canoe paddle. And I say, this is what we're looking at. When I talk about three meters of sea level rise projected for 2300, it's very impactful to stack three canoe paddles on top of each other because the numbers are not going to matter to a villager. Their perception of what those numbers matter, mean matter to a villager. And empowerment is critical in empowering them to believe that they're part of a collective that has solutions that they can start on now that will make a future for their children or grandchildren is critical. Also, in one of the last question that was addressed, there is a downstream application of this. It's very simple. In partner with stakeholders to organize existing information, you know, along knowledge modules that open 
speak to these individual stakeholders as well so they can better access the information. That's a downstream application of what we're talking okay. about as well. Thank you. I think we need to conclude there. Yeah. Uh, very fascinating discussions yeah. and, and presentations. <coughs>